All right, Ruth chapter number two. Ruth chapter number two in your Bibles. We're continuing to study the book of Ruth. Chapter number one last, or chapter two last, uh, when was it? Last Wednesday we looked at that. And we're going to try to uh, go through this book here. Ruth chapter number two. Ruth two. Joshua judges Ruth. We had already looked at three things that happened immediately when Ruth became a daughter in his house. Now remember, remember she, we saw her weakness. We saw Ruth's weakness and she was a damsel in his field. And then we see her last week as Ruth's welcome. Not only her weakness but her welcome. And now she, she was a daughter in his house. And we, we saw three things there. We said in Boaz's house, she had good instruction. Now, Boaz is a type of the Lord Jesus. You all know that. And if you're going to have good instruction, you, got to, you can't get it in the world. You can't get it on CNN. can't get it on Fox, Newsmax, whatever you watch. If you're going to get good instruction, you've got to get it out of the Bible. Amen. And so uh, she's in Boaz's house. And we're in the house of God. Do you realize that? This is a, this is a church. Look, I'm glad we're not called a worship center. I'm glad we're not called a, what do they call churches anymore? I mean, they, they come up with all kinds of names for them. Man, we're in a church. Amen. It's a house of God. Amen? Yeah. We're in a church. And I like to be, I, I like for, you know, when somebody says, where are you going? I'm going to church. Amen. Well, I'm going to the Living Waters facility. I'm going to the uh, Sea Breeze Whatever. I mean, I, I like going to a church. And ever since I was a kid, I went to church. I knew what a church was. Everybody else knew what a church was. Now you don't hardly know what they are. And once you get inside, you sure don't recognize them as a church. But anyway, I, I get off of that. But anyway, in Boaz's house, she's going to get good instruction. She's going to have food and fellowship. Look at verse 8. Verse 8 said, Then said Boaz and the roof, Ruth, Ruth chapter 2, then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field. He, he said, You stay here. Neither go from thence, but abide here fast by my maiden. So she's going to get good instruction. She's going to have great provision. And, uh, and she's going to uh, have a glorious adoration for Boaz. Now let's pick it up on verse number 11. And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been shown, shewed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law, since the death of thy husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy na nativity, and art come unto a people which thou know knewest not heretofore. Now, <clears throat> there's going to be a, a, a great revelation. She's going to learn some things here. Boaz, by the way, Boaz knew everything he, Boaz knew everything about her. There was not a thing he didn't know about her. By the way, Jesus knows everything about us. Man, he knows our thoughts. He knows the intents of our thoughts. And so and Boaz is going to know, uh, he's going to know everything about her. First of all, he knew about her desperation. Now, remember, she's in the land of Moab. Moab's a heathen country. And she's in the land of Moab, but she was brought to a place, in, in Moab, she was brought to a place of desperation. Now, remember what happened to her? Her husband died. She has nowhere to go. She can go back to her father and mother. But Moab is a place of desperation. And uh, that's, you know, usually that's when you call on God. Is when you're desperate. You know, everything going good. We, we say, you know, I can handle it. What, what's the saying they say now? I got it. I got it. You think you got it. You got something. If I'd have said that to my daddy, he would have said, you got something all right. I just don't know what it is. <laughs> but Ruth... Uh, in her desperation, she's in the land of Moab. And he knew about that. He knew where she came from. And so you call upon God when you're desperate. And then he knew about her separation. Now by faith, by faith, she's going to leave her father and mother in the land of Moab. And uh, she's going to a place she's never been before. She's going to be with people that she knows n nothing about. She's going to be traveling back with Naomi. You, you know the story. And so uh, he knew about her separation. Then he knew about her salvation. And look what he says in verse 11. He says, Thou art come, the last statement, that thou art come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. He knew about her salvation. Now, 
After you got saved, guess what happened to you? You became one of those that you talked about before you got saved. <laughs> yeah. I ain't going to be one of them old holy Joes, those Bible thumpers. I ain't going to the bunch of sissies up there at that church. And, and then when you got saved, boy, you became, you became one of them. Amen. You know what? Uh, I'm, I'm glad I'm one of them. By the way, I'm one of them that believes this Bible. I'm one of them that believes in fellowship with God's people. This lonely stuff, this, this being on an island by yourself somewhere and worshiping God in nature and all that stuff, I'm going to tell you something. You need fellowship. You need fellowship. You need people to love you. You need people to say, I'm praying for you. You need people to care about you. You need fellowship. And we can't do without fellowship. And, and, and so he knew about her salvation. Now look at verse 12 and 13. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wing thou art come to trust. Then she said, let me find favor. Now remember, we see grace in verse number 2. She said, in whose sight I shall find grace. We see grace in verse number 10. Why have I found grace in thine eyes? And now she says, let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord. For thou hast comforted me, and for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, though I be not like one of thine handmaids. You know, I, I'm glad that Boaz spoke kindly to her. You know, I think we can take a lesson from Boaz. You know, some, sometimes we get, uh, we, get, we get harsh with people sometimes, don't we? And I'm, I'm going to tell you something. You get harsh with people, the Holy Ghost is going to let you know that you did it. Yeah. I, I, I've actually been embarrassed by people, <clears throat> by maybe a, a, a group of people, church people, going to a restaurant all at one time. And that little, that little waitress, she's trying to do the best she can. And some church member will just jump on her. Man, that embarrasses me. That embarrasses me. And uh, you, sh you shouldn't do that. She can't help it. She might be lost. And then you try to give her a track with a dollar tip. Yeah, that's going to that's gonna go over like a lead balloon, isn't it? I I'm just telling you, sometimes we're, we don't speak. I, I think we need a revival of kindness sometimes. I got to let myself know I'm going to Walmart. I'm going to Walmart. I'm going to Walmart. I got to be kind. I got to be patient. I got to be gentle. got to be... <laughs> I, you don't have that problem, I know, but I do. I got that problem. I saw one of our folks uh, last night in Walmart, uh, one of our teenagers, and uh, it was about a distance, but maybe from here to, to Brother Bill, and I, I looked at her and she looked at me. <laughs> she couldn't believe that so she saw a pastor at Walmart. <laughs> and I saw her and I said, well, I better straighten up. I got one of my church members here. <laughs> no, no I didn't, I'm just kidding. Uh, anyway, I'm going to tell you, sometimes you got to, before you speak, you've you got to pray. You say, Lord, help me. Help me to be kind to people. You know what? That, that's what's missing from us who know our doctrine. We really know the Bible inside and out. But we're just so snotty. And we're so unkind sometimes. And I'm so glad that Boaz, and look, she recognized that. Boaz spake kindly unto her. Just a handmaiden. And, but he spoke kindly unto her. Well, he knew about her salvation. Now, verse number 13. Um, then she said, let me find favor in thy sight. I read that, didn't I? For thou hast comforted me, for thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, though I be not like one of thine handmaidens. Now, in verse number 14, we see Ruth's uh, wealth. Now, remember, she's weak when she comes into the picture. She's a damsel in his field. She's welcomed at his table. She's a daughter in his house, rather. But then she's a diner at his table. In verse number 14, he invites her. Look what it says. And Boaz said unto her, At mealtime, come thou hither, and eat of the bread, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, and he reached her parched corn. And she did eat, and was sufficed, and left. Now look at her. She's a gleaner in the field. And there, as far as I can tell, there's no other gleaners at his table. But she's at his table. She's there at his table, um, verse 14, along with the reaper. She sat beside the reapers, and he reached her parched corn and everything. Now, thank God that, that this thing of working for the Lord or serving God, 
let me just say this. It's not all labor. There's times that we need just to sit at the Lord's table, to sit at his table. I'm talking about fellowshipping. You know, Martha had to learn that lesson. Remember Martha and Mary, Mary and Martha, two sisters there? She was covered about with much serving, the Bible says. But the Bible says that Mary sat at his feet, the Lord Jesus' feet. And uh, there's a lot of people are, are missing this thing. Uh, they're, they're almost like Martha. And they're serving here. They're doing this. When we got to run this route. we got to do this thing. we got to make sure this is right. And we get so busy that we don't take time to sit. At the feet of Jesus. And you know what Jesus said about that, don't you? He said, Mary hath chosen that good part. You know what we're doing tonight? We ought to be sitting at the feet of Jesus, learning his word. That's the good part. That's the good part of the Christian life. Because one of these days, your body is not going to be able to labor like you want to labor. Now, hopefully your mind will still be okay and your heart will still be okay. You know what the Bible says about that? It says, yea, though the outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day by day. Amen. I'm glad it's like that because we're going to perish one of these days. Have you looked in the mirror lately? We're getting old. <laughs> I know some of you young people are not getting old. You'll never get old. But, <laughs> but here's a picture of one of the ordinances of the church. Look at verse 14 again. Look at it. Boaz said in her mealtime, come thou hither, eat of the bread and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. Now vinegar, a lot of times it was uh, vinegar of wine. It was, it was wine or grape juice. And so here we have a, uh, we, we have a picture of the ordinance of the church, bread and vinegar or bread and wine. Here is an, look, here is an unworthy person sitting at his table. What do you mean she's unworthy? Well, you know where she came from? Where? Moab, you know what she was, her nationality? She was a Gentile. Yeah. Now, do you know in the Old Testament, two people, two people in the Old Testament were unworthy to sit at a table. One was by the name of Mephibosheth, and he sat at David's table, the king's table. And boy, he sat there. Look, he was crippled. You know what sin does to us? Cripples us. But thank God for his marvelous grace that he invites us once we've trusted Christ and repented and got to look, look, uh, got the scars in our life. He still saves us and he invites us to sit at his table. Not only that, not only he was, he was a Jew. He was a Jew, Mephibosheth. But David said, you can sit at my table. And then we have Ruth, a Gentile, and she is, uh, uh, she is sitting at his table. So uh, both of them, both of them, according to the law, are unworthy to sit at the king's table. Now, there's none of us here worthy of salvation. Nobody. Nobody in this room worthy of salvation. But I'm so glad that we are invited to sit at the king's table. Amen. Amen. Well, you put these two together, and we see in Ephesians 2, Paul puts it together, and here's the way, here's the way he puts it. Ephesians chapter number 2, verse number 11. Ephesians 2, verse 11. Let me read it for you. Ephesians 2, verse 11. All right. Verse number 11 says, Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. That's what she was, Ruth was. That's what Mephibosheth was in a, in a sense. He crippled up. And strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now in, in Christ Jesus, you who are sometimes far, far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall, our petition uh, uh, between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of co commandments contained in ordinances, for to making himself between one new man and so making peace. Now, so it's a picture of one of the ordinances in the Bible. And then look at verse 14 again. Look at verse 14. Notice what it says, the last part. She did eat and was sufficed and left. Now, notice when she was satisfied, she left. I wonder where she went. Where did she go? Did she go back to Moab? You know where she headed? 
He went back to his fields. Went back to his fields. Look, you get a good dose of salvation, you get a good taste of the Lord Jesus Christ, you won't want to go anywhere else. I've heard people say, talking about losing your salvation. Well, if I believed like you did, I'd, I'd go and do anything I wanted to do. I said, I do. I do anything I want to do. I just don't want to do a lot of things anymore <laughs> like I used to. <laughs> Amen. I'm just telling you, once you get a good dose of salvation, once Jesus comes in your life and, 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 and all that he has done for you, you mean to tell me you want to go back to those hell holes that you once were a part of? Not me, brother. You can have it. I've had my taste. I've had my full of it. I don't want any more of it. How about you? Well, I found something better. Amen. Well, when she was satisfied, where did she go? She went back to the fields, verse number 15. And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men saying, let her glean among the sheaves and reproach her not. Now, she didn't have to be told to go back to the fields. She didn't have to be whipped to go back to the fields. You know, she went to the fields on the joy that she got at his table. She said, boy, Boaz has been so good to me, I'm gonna go work in his fields. I'm, going, I'm not gonna quit, I'm not gonna retire. I don't have to be told to do that. Look, it's a shame for God's people, it's a shame for pastors to beat their brains out trying to get God's people to come to church. Yeah. When they know they ought to be in church. Yeah. By the way, I, I just, uh, I like what Brother Eddie did one time. He said, I told you this, some of you did, haven't heard this, but Brother Eddie said he went and got a checkup local doctor there in Raynell, West Virginia. And he said, Eddie, your blood pressure's good. Your heart rate's good and everything. And, and, and Eddie, how, how come you, he said, to be, to pastor that many people. And I think, I think they were, he was pastoring six to 700 people in that little town. And he said, Eddie, he said, your blood pressure's good. He said, your heart rate's good. Your cholesterol's good. And you got 600 people, you pastor. He said, what's the secret? Eddie said, I just don't care. <laughs> now, now, Eddie did care, but I'm just going to tell you what. <laughs> Pastors, sometimes they get ulcers and they get all kinds of health problems and things like that. And uh, I'm telling you what, trying to get God's people to do what they're supposed to be doing in the first place. Yeah. Amen. Well, no wonder Paul says, to them, he said, uh, you need, he said, there, there's need that you have meat. You ought to be on the meat, but I, I've got to feed you with milk. He said, you got to start all over. And uh, it's a shame. I've, I've preached, I've preached uh, several years, and, and I preached, uh, uh, I, I preached on the subject of eternal security and people in the congregation, not anybody here, but people in the congregation, with, and uh, they would sit there and they'd listen and they'd listen. I hope they would listen, 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 listen. And, uh, they believe you can lose your salvation. And I'm thinking, my word, <laughs> what in the world's wrong with you? <laughs> Did you listen? Am I beating my brains out? And uh, so you got to realize, I, I like what Bill's uh, Sunday school lesson was about this morning. He talked about preachers and pastors and things like that. Well, when she was satisfied, she left, but she went to glean in his field. Look at verse number 15. Here's a privilege, a great privilege that she had. Verse 15 says, when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young people say, or young men saying, let her glean even among the sheaves, reproach her not, let, and let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her and leave them that she may glean them and rebuke her not. So she gleaned in the field unto even and beat out she had gleaned, uh, that she had gleaned. It was about an ephah of barley. Now, she gleaned until it was time to stop. When was the time to stop? In the evening. But she didn't take a break, as far as we know. She gleaned, she kept gleaning and gleaning until the evening. We don't know what happened in the field that day, but she stayed with it. We don't know what kind of distractions there may have been, but she stayed with it. By the way, if you're doing anything for God, I promise you this, there's gonna be distractions. There'll be distractions in your family, there'll be distractions in your friendships, There'll be distractions in your finances. There'll be a lot of things that will try to get you to quit gleaning in the field of God. Get you to give up. Say, well, what's the use? But you just keep on. It's, the, it's God's field. Remember, she just got up from his table with a renewed strength. And that's why you need church. And that's why we need Bible study. And that's why we need Sunday school. And that's why we need revival meetings. Because we, got, we get weak sometimes, don't we? And we got to get built back up.
But Boaz let some handfuls of purpose fall for her. And you know something? We just need to keep gleaning and gleaning and gleaning until Jesus comes. Look at verse 17. Verse 17 says, So she gleaned in the field unto Eden, and beat out that she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. Now, her faithfulness in gleaning. Gleaning, if you know anything about gleaning, it's a, it's a very humble work. You've got to get down on your knees. You've got to get down, and you've got to get really low in order to glean. And that's why many people don't glean in God's fields. They say, you know, I'm, I'm above that. You're not above that. You're not above that. God wants you. By the way, if, if you're high and lifted up, God can't use you. He can't use a proud spirit, can he? He uses somebody that will humble themselves and make themselves low and present themselves. The Bible says that Jesus made of himself no reputation, but uh, made himself form of a servant and became a servant, and he died for our sins. Thank God for that. Gleaning is a humble work, but gleaning is hard work. And remember, she is from Moab. She didn't, look, think about this. She's from Moab. She don't even know how to glean. They didn't have anything like that in Moab. But she stuck with it. She was willing to learn. I'm thankful for God's people that will, that will come, maybe at an invitation or come anytime, and they'll come to a pastor and say, Preacher, I'd like to be a Sunday school teacher. Man, that thrilled my soul. I said, well, let's get some material. Let's get the Bible. Let's start learning some stuff. I've never done it before, but I'm willing to do it. Thank God for people like that. That's the way I learn. That's the way you'll learn. It's just present yourself, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. God wants to use you. So I, I can't do it. Look, if God's calling you to do it, he'll provide the way. I promise you that. He'll, he'll let you. Know. Look, I, I'd hate to think that God would call you to do something and then he'll say, you're on your own. He's not going to do that. He'll not do that. Well, she closed out today with an F of barley in verse number 17. Now, there's three places that God prepared some, something to finish our ministry with, and these things are necessary for life. Now, in, in, in our story here in Ruth, he gave Ruth a bushel. She needed that for food. And remember that widow, uh, that the, the meal in her barrel? God provided that through a miracle, through the prophet Elijah. And he gave the widow a barrel. And that was for flour. She had flour in that barrel. You know what she needed that for? She needed bread. But Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word proceeded out of the mouth of God. But we still need bread. And then, you know what, we're talking about the ministry here. God gave Ruth um, a bushel, gave the widow a barrel, and gave old Paul. You know what, what the Lord allowed Paul to have? Gave him a basket. Remember they let him down in a basket? Boy, he needed that, didn't he? And that basket was for his protection. Well, we read verse 17. Look at verse number 18. Verse 18 says, And she took it up. Well, she gleaned in the field and so forth. She took it up, verse 18, and went to the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned, and she brought forth and gave to her that she had reserved after she was sufficed. Now, she was faithful. She gleaned until the end of the day. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, at the close of the day, we're all going to stand and give an account of our gleaning. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. And we're going to give an account of what we did with God's word and God's work. Then she had a full basket at the end of the day. She didn't leave, look, she didn't leave that field until her basket was full. Now think about that. That's the way I want to leave this old world. I want to leave with a full basket, don't you? I don't want to leave anything undone or half done. And then here, here's what I like about verse 17. She gleaned in the field until evening, and notice what it says, and beat out that she had gleaned. She forsook that which was no good. Now, you know, she beat out what she had gleaned. And what they did there was the grain and the chaff had to be separated. And they did that by using a blunt instrument, a heavy instrument, and would beat that thing until it separated. And what did she do with the good stuff? She brought it back home and she left the bad stuff in the dirt. Now, think about that. She carried the good part with her to the city, and she left the bad stuff at the dirt, in the dirt. Now, 
You're in God's field and I'm in God's field. And the Bible says that the word of God is like a hammer. Remember that? It's applied to my life. And when the word of God is applied to my life, it is separating the good from the bad. That's why you need Bible preaching. Because that hammer will come down and it will beat and will beat and will beat. And it will separate the good from the bad. And I'm going one day when my divine Boaz calls, I'm going one day, I'm going to leave all the bad stuff here on earth and I'm going to carry the good stuff to the city. Amen. And so will you. Well, Ruth, before she leaves that field, she's going to leave behind the bad stuff and she's going to take the good stuff home with her. Now look at verse 18. Look at her thoroughness. And she took it up, went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned, and she brought forth and gave to her what she had reserved after she was sufficed. Now, I want you to see a little statement here in verse number 18. And gave to her, the last part, and gave to her that she had reserved after she was sufficed. Now, she, what she carried with her was life. Now think about this. This grain was life. And people needed bread to live. By the way, people need bread and water. You, you know you can live on bread and water? And so she, she carried with her life. And she was about to share it. Now let me just say this. That notice before she gave this to, uh, she went to the city. Before she gave this to her mother-in-law, uh, she the Bible says, gave to her that she had reserved after she was sufficed. Now, here's what I'm saying. Ruth satisfied herself before she gave away any of the grain. He said, isn't that being kind of selfish? No. Let me just tell you this. You can't win folks to Christ if you're not convinced yourself. You know what some of our high-powered churches are doing? They're getting people saved, hopefully, and they're giving them a gospel track and say, just go out there and just win people to Christ. And they, use the, they say that's the Great Commission. But let me show you what's missing in the Great Commission, many of our churches that does this for practice. Let's go to Matthew 28. You know, this, you know the scripture. Let's look at it. Matthew chapter number 28. So we got people trying to tell folks about Jesus and they don't know anything about Jesus themselves. He said, are you serious? I'm serious. Matthew 28. We get them in, we get them out, we get them back in. They come back in, they're discouraged. They say, I can't win anybody to Christ. Now, let me show you what's happening here. Jesus said in verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now, is that what we're supposed to do? Absolutely. But we forget verse number 20. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Now, ladies and gentlemen, somebody's got to take those young converts and teach them, verse 20, to observe all things whatsoever I commanded them to do. Now, you know what we're doing? A lot of churches are getting young people in or older people. They're getting saved. They're being sent out. And so you go win people to Christ. We ought to win people to Christ. But before we win people to Christ, a church needs to teach them people what Jesus said. And church needs to teach the doctrine of grace. Because you get out there and there's going to be some people that knows a little bit more Bible than you do, although they twist the scriptures. And they'll chew up and spit out a young convert and he'll get so discouraged he'll never come back to church. Larry, Larry, uh, uh, he's, he's a commander in, in a way. But you know what he has to do with his soldiers? He's got to teach them how to be soldiers. Look, when they come in, they don't slap a uniform on, give them a gun and say, go. <laughs> well, we think that's funny, but that's what a lot of pastors are doing in their churches. Yeah. 
they're getting young converts and giving them a track and get out and go win people to Christ. You better teach them something first. Amen. You better give them some Bible. You got to look, and that's what Sunday school's about. That's what church is about. That's what preaching and teaching's about. And if you'll check it out, every time Jesus preached one time, he preached three. Every time Jesus preached once, he taught three times. You check it out. I, I traced every every verse that what, what, when it comes to him preaching. I marked it down. When it comes to him teaching, three times more than he preached. And so Bible preaching is important, don't you think? But teaching is too. So what do we got to do with our people? We get them in and we got to preach to them, but we got to teach them and then send them out to win a world to Jesus Christ in his field. Somebody's got to bring them to maturity and the church has got to do it. Go and give the good grain to somebody else. After you have been sufficed, after you have been filled up, then you go give it to somebody else. And that's the way to do it. Amen. All right. We'll pick the study up this coming Wednesday, chapter two. We're going to be looking at the place where she went in verse number 18 after she was satisfied in verse number 18. Father, we ask dear God that you'll help us as we look at this great story of Ruth. Help us, Lord, to realize you got a lot to say. And we've got a lot to learn. And Father, I pray that we would just be ready to learn and be ready to do what you'd have us to do. Give us a good night tonight, Lord. Help us keep our minds on Christ. Camp meeting coming up, all these things coming about. I pray, Heavenly Father, that we would just learn how to sit at your feet and glean from your word. We ask tonight, if there should be one here that needs to be saved, would you please save them? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.